don't, I don't really think about it too much because uh, I think when you start thinking about things like that, you uh, starts playing things on your mind. I think when when it starts getting tough, that's when you when I start thinking about start thinking about my two boys. Yeah, my two boys and my wife, and then I, uh, you know, it sort of gives me a bit of reality again, and wanting to live a bit longer. <laughs> so, yeah. It's tough though, because um, you know, for six hours, four to six hours, you you're stuck to this machine. But you know, I guess that's. Uh, better than the other option, which isn't really an option. This is part and parcel of what I have to do to, to live. I can't change anything. Uh, I can only just hope and just do the things that I can I can control. And this is one thing I can sort of control. This is significant for a lot of us who are friends and close friends with Danny Sakona. This is where we lost him and he died here. Uh, he was stabbed so many times and cut up and, and, and so forth um, by someone who we knew. And uh, it made, uh, made a lot of us wake up um, and realise, you know, what we were doing with our life and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it was it was a waste. It was a waste to lose him. So you know, he was so young, um, and also, you know, we we needed to we needed to figure out what we wanted to do. Uh, you know, we were all close together. Um, myself, my brother, uh, with Danny, and you know, there was a whole group of us that were really really close. I guess it also gave me a decision to try and figure out what I can do for my life. But it made me me. Uh, it made me fight for what I wanted and what I needed and uh, to get what I want. And uh, uh, this place did that to me. When you come from the streets and you come from South Auckland and you come from Mangri or Otara or Papatau, Rewa, you name it, when you're in the streets, you deal with the streets and you got street rules. Um, you know, sometimes you get away with it and sometimes you don't. But this is, you know, this is the life of that area. 
I think the toughest part about my childhood is that it's not a normal childhood. I was born in New Zealand, Auckland, uh, at National Women's Hospital. From there, I was I spent a year here, and you know, and then basically, my parents took me to Tonga, uh, where I wasn't brought up by my parents. I was brought up by my uh, my oldest, uh, my mum's oldest sister, uh, my auntie, uh, which basically, uh, for five, six years, I called her mum, and um, and wasn't until I was about you know I was six and I came back to New Zealand, um, that I found out who my real parents were and who I'd been calling auntie was really my mother and a man that I never knew. <laughs> so, you know, it, uh, it was a bit of a, uh, an uprooting and a bit of a rude awakening and a bit of a change, uh, a huge change um, in terms of where I grew up and where I, you know, when I was a youngster, you know, running around bare feet, um, didn't care whether I had a top on or not. Uh, and living off the land to being in the concrete jungle of Auckland City, or, you know, of uh, South Auckland. I guess it's a symbol for me more than anything else is because I always wondered what was always over the other side of the bridge. I guess when I was really young, um, like when beer mixing was a, a big thing, uh, there would be a group of us, me and a group of my friends. We used to ride uh, from, from Māngari itself and all the way out to Mission Bay and St Heliers. And that was done every weekend. It was a lot of fun. Um, my parents always wondered where I was because I was always coming home really late. and. Uh, doing things that you weren't supposed to do um, at that age. Um, what was it, I was eight, nine. <laughs> when I used to know that I was in trouble uh, from my parents, I used to come here and I used to sleep on this bridge. Because our parents are working long hours, um, our parents weren't about most of the time because they were working to put money on the table, um, so you'd always get up to mischief, and when you're young, um, that was one of the things you get up to, f go out, fight, cause trouble. Um, that was the, I guess that's what it was like growing up in South Auckland. There wasn't really much to do. You didn't really have too much in terms of money and that, so you'd end up hopping on a bus and heading into town, um, or grabbing alcohol and that. And, causing a bit of trouble. As you always know, when you grow up in that sort of arena, you know if your friends have to throw down, you go down with them, you know, and um, you do that sort of thing, and, and you jump into it. And, uh, you know, I was travelling down a path where, honestly, I shouldn't really be travelling down. You know, I was hanging out with people that you, you know, now are either six foot under the ground, or if not, they're in jail. There were days that you come home in a police car, uh, but that's part and parcel of it. There were days that you come home and you were beaten up by somebody um, from getting kicked in the head and, and so forth. But that was part of growing up. You know, you, you won all your fights, but you're going to come home bruised. Or if not, you knew you were outnumbered, so you better, got, you better have some really good running shoes on. If you touch somebody from one area and they all know each other, mate, the one thing you make sure is that they don't know who you are and don't know where you live because... Um, yeah, they don't, they're not shy of coming and knocking on your door and knocking you over. And the thing is, we don't do the things that, like, the US do. We don't do the drive-by shootings and so forth. We knock on your door and take your head off there. It's that sort of thing. It's, um, it's a tough area, but uh, proud to come from it. Um, I think it made me battle-hardened for, for rugby. The velocity of the attack in the Otara shopping mall stunned and disquieted the people of South Auckland. One man killed instantly. When you have relatives that die uh, violently, um, 
in, in ways that you cannot comprehend. Uh, you know, you, yeah, you just don't know what to do. Uh, but at that time, you know, there was a there was a lot of there was a rift between uh, you know the the in the Polynesian community, and the thing was uh, misidentity, wrong place at the wrong time, and uh, the thing was he he got he ended up in a, ended up getting decapitated, uh, got his head cut off, and you know this is not cool. I joined Jonah to Wesley College because I think it's the best for his academic. In uh, boarding school, I think it's best for him is not is far from some other children, not to go on the street. That's what I wish for him. I remember I wasn't happy about going. Uh, I was 12 at the time, 12, 13 at the time. The first time I came across Jonah uh, was really in his mother's car. Happy had arrived and come to see me. I live on campus and uh, she was concerned that Jonah's application into Wesley had not proceeded the way she'd hoped it had. Um, so uh, Happy, the mother, came and asked me to go and find out from the then uh, Deputy Principal Graham Watson, and I checked with Graham Watson, and they had some concerns about Jonah's background and so on. So I had to go back and give Happy a, a little bit of a sad news that they were reluctant to enrol him, and Happy then said, "Please." Could you see if, uh, if you can get him to come? So I went back to Graham Watson, and certainly at that stage, Graham thought we'll give him a go. Um, and I just remember uh, Jonah in the car with his mother, didn't get out of the car, and I remember Happy crying with tears. And as she drove away, I looked down at the concrete step. It was a sunny, bright day. But there on the step were the evaporating tears of joy. And I just thought, I wish I had my camera. Um, these are the tears of joy, the love of a mother for her son. The greatest thing to ever happen to me was to go to Wesley College, purely because uh, it, it saved me, to tell the truth. It really saved me. You know, at first, I hated it just purely because of what it stood for. I uh, had all this freedom and it was taken away from me. But uh, when I, I sort of got into a Wesley College life, it, um, you felt a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of pride um, in, your, in your uniform, your clothes. And uh, the first, first bell will go at six. And um, basically you're up, make your bed, uniform on and then you're out and you're doing your chores before eight o'clock. Eight o'clock bell goes and um, it's time for you to be at breakfast. And by the time you finish breakfast, it's like everybody into to chapel. So, you know, it was, a, it was an old military style school. I firmly believe that, the, you know, especially the Tongans, they send their uh, children to the school because of the Christian faith. Uh, because uh, in the island, uh, everybody belonged to a denomination. Uh, until they came to New Zealand, they seemed to drift away from all of those disciplines in life. And I think they find Wesley as a place to send uh, their boys in here.
Yeah, Wesley College was an interesting, interesting time. Uh, I found it difficult because you know I was a troubled child when I first started. My first year it was just uh, it was a living hell in the sense of you know you just you tried things on, you were doing things that you shouldn't be doing. When I realised that I couldn't, my parents would not be able to sustain paying that the whole time, and I got kicked out of, out of school as well. Um, I was very fortunate at the time that the uh, deputy principal of the school um, discovered that I had a really big vertical jump. I first noticed Jonah on the athletics field uh, in, in February of his first year at school. And uh, he was noticeable because he was winning all his races and, and was a standout athlete uh, during that day. I used to be the timekeeper and I would stand at the 100 metre finish line ready to take the stopwatch and there is nothing scarier than seeing this, this monster of a, of a boy um, hurling himself at you. And he had a funny sort of a lope when he ran. It was, it was an incredible sight and you just thought, I'm not going to get in the way of this man. One day I went to Wesley College and there was a young guy there who uh was pretty solid that he wasn't a rugby player, he was a league player, he just played league, you know? But he would spin the ball on his finger and back heel it and catch it around his shoulder and, you know, so he, he was sort of trying to impress, like, look at me, but I'm not gonna play rugby, I'm a leaguey. I approached the deputy principal of the day who was the first 15 coach and I said, look, I know he's only gonna be a year 10 student next year, but you really do need to give him a trial. He come up and he said, oh, hey, um, you want to trial out for rugby? <laughs> and uh, the interesting thing about it was that my line was, man, rugby, never played it. People say you must have uh, spotted talent. A blind man would have spotted John Olomo a talent. So there was no cleverness in that. So he had a trial and he made the first 15 as a lock, which is pretty unusual because most boys at 14 or 15 don't have the um, coordination or the strength or to actually be in the first 15. Yeah, I made the first 15 in, in full form. At the time, and still now, uh, which is still the youngest first 15 member. By the end of that, I'd, I'd had a national title my first year at, at first 15. I started learning about rugby and uh, I realised I was getting better at the game. But what I didn't tell anybody else was, I was playing league and I was, I, was, I was playing outside of the school and playing inside the school. I was playing in Auckland for Mount Wellington with my cousins and so forth and they were picking me up without the school knowing. But also at the same time, I was playing for the school. So I will play in the morning, play in the afternoon. Well, the, the thing was, you did your schooling in the mornings and then you did your sport in the afternoon. The thing was, I wasn't going to this school in the morning. I was going and playing rugby in the morning. <laughs> and this went on for quite a while. And it wasn't until a letter got sent to the school that I was selected for, for the Auckland team. <laughs> and the school wrote back and said, you must have the wrong Jonah because uh, he's at boarding school and he doesn't leave these grounds. And uh, when they traced it back, then they realised that it was. Um, and then my parents got called in and so forth, but that was, it was just me. Um, I think it was the part of me from growing up in South Auckland and the loyalty to your friends and, and your relatives and so forth. Yeah. I think we got a problem, tell them evacuate The animals escape, they need made it at the gate And now we constantly killing and getting shots that they be missing Illegal found a fish and then they added a vision He never listened to the ones that told him different Cause they the definition of the ones who never win it They telling him you made it, he know that ain't the case Surely there must be more, this must only be a taste So he be going hard, oh so hard Tell me what a universe will be with no stars Probably like you see them will be without me Trying to start your car when you ain't even got the key I'm looking for a reason, tell me why I shouldn't Take the soul and run and do what other brothers couldn't I'll be dropping my shoulders so nobody can bump me Till they consider me one of the best in the country I'm passing I guess the biggest thing for me with this bridge and stuff is that I, this is where I get away 
you know, just get out here and dream and, and think about things. But man, when I used to get angry, it was all, all driven at my dad more than anything else. At times he was the best dad that he could be. It was just when he drank. It's when me and him disagree. Um, he was quite violent when he was drunk. I guess the, the toughest part is that, you know, mum was always there to, to protect the kids and, and dad and dad got angry and so forth, wanted to bash us. <laughs> she'll get in the way and, uh, yeah, and she'll, you know, she get beaten up quite badly sometimes, you know? And it's, and it's tough to take. Yeah, just built up a lot of things inside me. It was pretty scary because, like, you know, I came from a religious family and, and so forth, and um, when I didn't listen to my dad and I rebelled against him, you know, he said that, uh, you know, uh, God himself will, um, will punish me and punish me badly, and, uh, and that I was going against him. But, um, yeah, and that was tough to swallow. Uh, it was hard. You know, I, wasn't, I wasn't just physically scarred <laughs> from a lot of things, but I was also, you know, the mental games that he played spiritually, really, that was tough. I guess that was the, the thing. And that was one of my biggest driving drivers, really, to get through things, is that uh, when I was playing, when I found it hard, you know, I just fought, fought of my father. And that got me through it. That anger got me through it. Uh, spent most of my life, you know, uh, fighting with that, you know, fighting with that um, inside me. And uh, yeah, it's, it's taken a long time taking a real long time to, to be able to come to terms with what my dad was. You know? and, uh, I took it out on other people, I took it out on other things. And that's what, um, I guess that was one, one of the biggest and hardest things to, to deal with. So, yeah, I had to rebuild that bridge and... Uh, me and dad, you know, we're in, we're in speaking terms and, we're, you know, we're, we're good. And a lot of it was that uh, having the two boys has really changed things, really, more than anything else. Changed it because it's, um, you know, I want my sons to know their grandfather before he leaves this planet. And uh, whatever the issues are between me and my dad shouldn't be issues or for my two sons. First time I met Jonah was at uh, Wesley College. Uh, they had a sevens team and uh, they asked me, I was playing for New Zealand sevens, they asked me to come out and take a training. And that's why I first met him. Six foot five, big, big guy, he could run really fast. And uh, everything about him was big, you know, the big legs and the big arms, and big nostrils. Yeah, he was a big man. I started at 89, 90 kilos when I first made the first 15. And at the end of that year, I was 102, 103. So I grew with the team. And by the time I left school, I was about 117, 116, somewhere in there. So, you know, I just kept growing with it and kept training. And it was just that. I was just wanting to learn, wanting to learn, 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 learn. The time that we got to closest together was when he was in the county's rep team, living in Mangere, and we had to travel over to the North Harbour, which was about a 40 minute drive and he couldn't stay over there billeted. For some reason, he had to stay at home. So I picked him up every day and drove, we drove him to the North Shore. Now, in those days, I had an old 
Japanese imported car that once I went over 90 Ks, it would go ting, 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 ting. Well, he thought this was hilarious, this car that went ting, ting, ting. And I would have my sort of music on or talk back radio. As soon as he jumped in the car, without even saying good morning, good afternoon, whatever, he'd put his tape on and we'd have boop, 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 boop. music that I absolutely hate. Boop, boop. I say, son, have we got to have this on? Yeah, 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 it just gets me in the mood just to, you know, boop, boop, boop. I said, fair enough, fair enough. If we have this music on the way to the game, you've got to have my music on the way home. Yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we go to the game, he'd play, he'd be outstanding as always, and uh, when he was ready to go, we'd, we'd come home and uh, he'd jump in the car again and do the boop, boop, boop. I'd take the tape out and put on Elvis Presley, return to sender. And um, rather, than us be, rather than him being disappointed and down about it, he started to like Elvis, you know? I think that we found that we had a very similar sense of humour. A Welshman from the other side of the world and this young Tongan boy from New Zealand. And we just shared a, a love of music. And, and we seemed to hit it off from there. As I keep saying to a lot of people, he was a gentle giant. You know, he, when he was hit hard by anybody, he smiled back. But he will give it back, you know, twice. And uh, he loves the physicality of the game. And uh, one of the things that he never back off, you know, from any physical situations where he have to face the opposition. It was like my, my schooling ground in preparing me for after, after leaving school. But I always thought that I was going to go back to league, rugby league, purely because um, I thought, well, at the time, that was the only professional sport. Rugby wasn't professional, uh, you know, so that was the only way I was going to be able to support myself and, and so forth. And uh, I'm trying to follow Jonah right through from his first year in the first 15 right through to his final year when I coach him in the first 15. And when he left school, I make sure he didn't go to league because I want him to be the first Tongan All Black as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I make sure that he's exposed to the top level of rugby straight from school and he was counties have offered that. And when it came to him leaving school, um, every province in New Zealand was chasing after Jonah Lomo. And uh, he came to um, uh, Amanaki Palavi, his Tongan teacher, brought him to see me. He said, Philly wants to talk to you. And we sat down and we talked about what he wanted to do. And I said, you need a career, not a job, a, a job driving a track. Or we had lost one of our county's players to Auckland. Uh, who they took down there and give a job cutting grass. I wanted Jonah to have a career, you know, there was no professional rugby. So we talked about it. I had a phone call that night and he said, Phil, I'm gonna stay in counties with you. Well, like, it was like winning lotto. You know, for him, for Jonah Lomo to stay in counties with us, and we were just winning the second division championship, it was immense. Jonah, when he came first into my, my world at counties, um, he had just left school. And uh, he came to our first training, incredibly keen, 19 years old, strapping young man. And all we basically did was try and, and give him some things that he could work within the sevens concept. Bob Lendrum was coaching the, the county sevens. He was a great sevens man, all black as well. And we had a very good county sevens side. Myself and uh, my fellow selector, Earl Curtin, were watching the national sevens tournament. Uh, in 1994, and Jonah had just come out of school, and he was playing in the county's uh, sevens team, and was making a real serious impact on the sevens. Lots of pace, lots of power, and the ability to beat people, and very good ball skills. When we went to the sevens, we basically told him that we we're going to give him the ball. Sevens, there's heaps of room and he was going to go out there and express himself, and he did at will. He ran around, ran through, ran over everybody that he came across, and, and 94 counties won the sevens, and I can honestly say most probably 70% of the reason we won was because of Jonah. I, I sort of knew that in Palmerston North when I selected him for my side uh, for the first time to make the New Zealand team. It was just a matter of time before Jonah would go on to, to bigger and brighter things, and that's to be an All Black, and, um, and that certainly happened. I mean. In Hong Kong in 94, it launched his career, really. When I 
arrived there and I remember looking up and I was going, far out, I'm in Hong Kong. Yeah, fantastic city. Um, stays alive all night long. I'm about to play for my country. Eric Rushy was our captain at the time. We arrived at the grounds and we started looking at things and uh, you could feel the, the atmosphere. It's what really drove me to want to be an All Black after playing that tournament. When you've got someone like Jonah Loma in your team, the important thing is, particularly around set piece, you want to give him the ball. You don't want to take the ball away from him. And because in the game of sevens, it allows you to express yourself. And by Jingo's, did Jonah express himself in the game of seven? So New Zealand using Seymour, Lomu and Rush as their forwards. Le plus marrant, c'est vrai que je joue face à lui. Il jouait pilier et moi je jouais talonneur. Et on voit ce colosse, donc 2 mètres, euh, je sais pas, 100, 120 kilos, euh, et qui, voilà, qui était le, déjà le Lomu qu'on qu a vu un peu plus tard avec les, les Blacks, à traverser le terrain tout seul, euh, les cannes, le raffut, le raffut, le, le cadrage des bords, la puissance, euh, enfin, déjà un extraterrestre. I remember he made his uh, debut in the Hong Kong Sevens. And I have an elder brother called Graham, who lives in Australia. He comes on the phone to me, he says, you will not believe this kid called Lomu. He is fantastic. There were some young boys, all very fast players, but none were as quick as him. In 15s, I can run and hide. You know, I can run behind the 14 guys, they can defend. When I see John, I run away. I don't want to stay on that side. But in 7s, you have to be somewhere. You'll meet Jonah, definitely. Whether you cannot run away, whether you run away, it's gonna be five. Six, you are in front. That's what I did, I was trying to run away from Jonah. <laughs> in the end, I have to tackle him once. I was like closing my eyes and he hit me like I flew about. I can like flew from Australia to New Zealand. <laughs> it was really difficult to play with him in sevens. Fiji are out. Australia and New Zealand are in. Well, the impression started well before the final. He was it was pretty much a single a single man demolition job. He was just toying. It was like boys playing men um, when they're actually defending him. He was able to drag at least two to sometimes three defenders to make a tackle on him, and he'd either sometimes break those tackles or he'd be able to get his hands free because he has very good ball skills for sevens and he'd get an offload. He was unstoppable. So trying to tackle him one on one was very very difficult. And plus he ran like the wind and very, very agile for a big man. So he was like the incredible, incredible package. He went to Hong Kong, come back, and he said to me, um, Laurie Main have approached me to play on the wing. And I said, and he said, I don't know much about playing on the wing. I said, no, this is your, you've got people that you can ring. I'll ring people that, you know, to give you advice how to play on the wing. He came in in 1994 and, and clearly struggled a little bit positionally. I was a little surprised because that he went to the All Blacks so early because remembering in the 15s game, he was a number eight. In the sevens game, you can play in any position for someone like Jonah, so it was easier to make that transformation into a winger at that age. In the game of 15s, at the international level, and when you're playing the French, you're playing against some of the best back lines in the world, you know, he got exposed. Here come the All Blacks, led out by the captain, Sean Fitzpatrick, and Philippe Saint-Andre leads out the French team, Jonah Lomu, the youngest All Black ever, 19 years and 45 days old. And then you had to question, was it too early? And I personally think it perhaps it was, it was a year too early, um, but because he made a complete change from a number eight to into an international winger, and it's pretty difficult to make that change in such a short space of time. Uh, it's the first time ever uh, that we've lost to France and New Zealand a series. And unfortunately, Jonah um, was playing against some of the best wingers in world rugby. And for a, a player that was starting out his career, um, it was a very diff difficult initiation, um, but one that was going to prove uh, to be very beneficial going forward. C'était la première fois qu'on découvrait un joueur atypique, vraiment une deuxième ligne, voire une troisième ligne qui jouait trois carrés, mais qui était puissant, qui était vite qui était capable de te faire un cadrage d'ébordement, qui était capable de te rentrer dedans, donc tu n'étais jamais sûr de rien, mais qui avait des, quelques lacunes aussi en défense, euh, qui n'arrivait pas toujours à se placer, qui avait un problème de disponibilité, donc de replacement, notamment sur les ballons en profondeur. Et finalement, euh, on 
s'est focalisé un petit peu sur lui. Euh, J'ai parlé un peu à Philippe Sella, je lui ai dit, écoute, tu vas te servir un peu plus de moi, parce que euh, le phénomène, quand même, il n'est il il pas évident à prendre. Et je pense qu'on a essayé de, justement de le raisonner euh, plus en mat matière co collective, défensivement. Look, you remember, you put yourself in the same shoe. 18 years old, playing against France. You know, seriously, that's like, you know, and I think it was a year before, he was out of school. School year, school boy, right? School boy, there's not even a blended, like, you know, school boy, then under 21s, and then you get a trial, oh, you missed out this year. No, what you do, chuck them straight in there. So that's why you have to put things in perspective. Quand vous commencez une carrière internationale par une, une énorme déception, il vaut mieux que ça arrive très jeune. Vous en tirez des enseignements exceptionnels et donc à travers ça, vous basez votre travail pour, pour le futur. They just dropped him straight away and it really hurt him. Rejection was not a good thing and not a thing that Jonah took kindly to and uh, he felt betrayed a little bit and he didn't blame that he was dropped. He knew that he hadn't played very well, but it, uh, it, 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 it showed him straight away that there's no favors. If you don't do the job, you're gone. There was a time there when uh, he wanted to go to rugby league because he thought uh, that the All Black selectors uh, uh, didn't want him uh, to be in the All Blacks. He never said much to me, but he turned this day and said to me, Uh, I'm going to go to the Sydney Bulldogs. I've had an offer on the table to go to the Sydney, Bu Sydney Bulldogs for three years. I tried to explain that rugby was, was not about uh, the coaches, it was about the guys you play with. So just play with the boys, don't worry about the rest. Before the 95 World Cup, this is one of the places where I had to come and run to get fit, to be able to, to do the things that I needed to do to, to get into the All Black team. And um, there was a lot of blood, a lot of swearing and a lot of sweat that was uh, shed here and a lot of tears, but uh, you know, that's part and parcel of what we had to do. At the beginning of 95, we had a series of camps for All Black contenders. Brian Lahore, Colin Meads and myself uh, met with Jonah and said that if we were selecting uh, the All Black team tomorrow, we wouldn't be able to select him due to his level of fitness. We trained really hard in 95. We, you know, we trained hard on anyone and probably the person that found it hardest and probably wanted to do as well as anyone was Jonah Lomu. There were 20. 150 metre runs in this tour at hot as hell Taupo. And we had to do them repetitively. They were awfully hard to do, particularly for aerobic capacity. Jonah ended up, of the 20 we were doing, he was suddenly 18 on 18 after everybody had finished at 20. He was wheezing like, like nothing on earth. His wheeze was going, and all I could hear, I was halfway down the pitch, I could hear this incredible scream. And he was running with Rushy. Rushy was the only one running with him because everyone else had finished. And Rushy was telling him that if he stopped, he'd kill him. He had to keep on running. It was those bloody white men down the other end waiting for him to give up. And that, that all they wanted was for him to give up so they could drop him. And he's cutting him and goading him like nothing on earth. And the language was even worse than that. He was calling him a big black whatever it was, and only Rushy could get away with it. Then Laurie said to Rushy, do you want to do another one? And Rushy said, yes. Right, he said, we'll do another one. If he'd have said no, he'd have said, oh, you don't, so we'll do another one. So the key couldn't win. Yeah, you know, it was all thanks to, to the trainers and all my friends, you know, kicking me up the backside and, yeah, come on, Jonah. Yeah, getting me to, to run. He comes back for 19 and the uh, team are all lining up on the goal line watching him. No one said a word while he ran. It was 
absolutely deathly silence by the wheeze of a Jonah fighting for breath. And then they decided he was trying so hard, which was one of Fitzy, captain, took off after him. Zinzan Brook then went. Then Rob Brook went. And then someone said, well, I don't want to be the last one standing here on the line. He said, we might as well all go. So the whole team went with Jonah on this last run, encouraging him to keep on going. They wouldn't let him stop, but they were there to help him to get to the other end. Now, that is just an indication of what the All Black family is. They wanted him in the All Blacks, so they, they knew uh, for us to select him, they had to get him fitter, and they did their bit to, to achieve that. And Mains and I stuck out a hand. He said, we've made it. Love accepted him. He's going to be it. Now, at the end of those camps, we, he still wasn't fit enough, and we allowed him to be selected for the New Zealand Sevens. Uh, and when no other All Blacks had been selected, he thought that meant the end of the line for him. The media all said, if Laurie lets anybody play in the Sevens, it means that he doesn't want them for the World Cup. That really gutted Jonah, because he thought Laurie had been unfaithful to him and told him lies. And Laurie hadn't. Laurie had been straight all along the line. But Jonah took it as rejection again, that the only reason he's in the Sevens is he ain't wanted for the fifteen. We wanted Jonah for two reasons to work under Gordon Titchens. One, he would get him an awful lot fitter because Sevens is a game that Jonah loved. He's handling the ball a lot, so he's going to work a lot harder at it. And two, Gordon was also a very, very good skills coach. So he did in 95, he single-handedly just won me the tournament in 95, incredible. But uh, again, Jonah at trainings never ever gave in. He mightn't have been up to where the other guys were, but he never gave in. And I didn't know then, probably then, and no one did, that how sick Jonah really was. So that even, when you think about that, it's certainly uh, for someone, <laughs> certainly a lot of courage because I pushed my players mentally and physically very, very hard, and, uh, and Jonah never once ever backed down. I did go to the World Cup in 95, and I knew that I was sick. Um, and then uh, I had to confirm it to the rest of the world in 96 that I was. You know, I, I was hoping that, you know, that you know, it would get better, but um, it never did. But, you know, I would never change anything. Um, it's made me me, and... Uh, it's made me a bit of me too. The key thing for me was that I didn't want my doctors telling the coaches. Because one of two things could happen is that the coach goes, oh, well, if he's sick, then we don't want him in the team because the last thing we want is him being a, a hindrance on the, on the boys. And also, I wanted to make the team on my own merits. Not because of they feel sorry for me or anything like that. So, you know, I had to make sacrifices, huge sacrifices. number. I wanted to be 
the best number 11 that could be. When they came to South Africa in 1995, there was this young kid that nobody really knew how good he was, but everybody heard that this is this very special athlete that's coming with New Zealand uh, to the World Cup. Jonathan Lomu, 94, Jonathan Lomu, 95, he is completely different. I think the eviction he had in 94 has made him even more strong. He emerged as an incredible player um, on a world stage, and I think everyone will remember that 1995 World Cup as a launching pad for what we now talk about as the, the Jonah Lomu effect. He was on the, the scene, he was playing rugby at exactly the right time for Jonah Lomu. Jonah was arrivé au moment où le rugby devenait professionnel. Il est arrivé à un moment où on a commencé à parler d'argent dans le monde du rugby avec son, son côté professionnel, donc à la fois la médiatisation nécessaire. People remember that World Cup for Nelson Mandela and Springboks winning, but from a rugby perspective, Jonah Lomu put rugby on the world map. Yeah, there was people in the USA talking about John Lomu. He was on all the front pages of most of the papers around the world. Um, he had offers coming in from anywhere, from the, from the NFL, from Rugby League, um, which was cre creating interest in our, our game. It was the first professional star of our game, at a moment where rugby had need of recognition, of recognition, of recognition, of recognition, of recognition, of recognition, of partners, of economic partners qui allait venir progressivement dans le monde du rugby. Donc cette conjonction entre le moment où le rugby devient professionnel et la façon dont John Alobu s'inscrit dans cet univers-là, collait parfaitement à la façon d'aborder le jeu de demain. When John Alobu left South Africa, he did things on the rugby field that nobody has done before. He was a legend. When I ran out onto the field, I always thought to myself I was the best player in my position. And um, whoever was coming up against me, didn't matter who they were, didn't, didn't care where they came from and so forth, um, I was going to dominate. Uh, whether if it was with speed, and if I, they matched me for that, then they had to deal with me physically. And, uh, and that was the one thing that I had that a lot of other players didn't have, was that I could play the two games. I could play the speed game and I could also play the physical game. He did things on the rugby field that no other person could do before then. And ever since, there's no one who's been able to do that same thing either. So, yeah, not just as a winger, I think it's just as a rugby player, full stop. He was, uh, he was out of the ordinary. Took him down, they didn't hold him, and they go to the corner now. And there's where Cronfeld joins, rips it away and scores the try. He's basically a lock. You know, six foot four, playing on the wing, doing sub 11 second hundreds. You know, I mean, that's just unheard of. And and then also to be that size and that nimble, stepping and scything and all the great things of a winger, and then having that massive mitt that just just to palm people away. We knew he was he was an exceptional player. We thought we could tackle him, but until you came up against him on the pitch, you suddenly realised that this guy was very, very special. He had an ability to step out of a tackle. If you could not get him, he would step out and keep going. And, um, you know, he must have been fantastic to play with because, you know, in that World Cup, he was so much bigger and stronger and faster than, than anyone. And that gave the New Zealand team, obviously, a huge advantage. And the All Blacks played to him. They used him an awful lot. Um, um, he got a try against, uh, against us in the first few minutes. New Zealand on the charge, and Jonah Lomo with another chance here. Lomo goes round, Greg Joyner, and the big man has scored. Whenever this man gets the ball, there's so much danger. He scores his third try for New Zealand. I remember after we lost... Um, to New Zealand and, and I had finished playing rugby, finished and uh, retired and um, I met the Underwood boys in, in the airport the next day and they came over and they said, oh, bad luck. And he said, what's he like? And obviously we knew who he was talking about and um, 
you know, I just said, ah, oh, well, you know, you'll be fine, no problem, and just be strong and all this. And I remember the following week in uh, Newlands in Cape Town, and I was sitting with my wife watching the game and just laughing. Il y avait quelques commentaires qui se faisaient même Underwood, le jeune frère de de Rory, qui qui avait dit oui, mais. John Alomu, il n'a joué que contre des ailiers euh, qui n'étaient pas vraiment d'envergure. Et donc, on verra bien quand euh, il rencontrera de, de véritables ailiers. And I suspect some of the comments that my brother said uh, about um, Jonah, which, from my understanding, having spoken to him, was done in the most respectful way, but of course, depends how it's written and how it's taken, uh, obviously galvanized not only the Kiwis, but obviously uh, Jonah. And um, so he came out uh, with a point to prove. I remember sitting in the team team meeting on the Friday night before we before we played them, and, and Jack Ryle asked the question: "Is right? How are we going to contain Jonah Lomu?" And I think he asked Tony Underwood the question, and Tony Underwood said, "Well, you know, I'm going to get in his face. I'm going to make sure I just get in his face all day and, and grab hold of him, and then two or three guys can come in and and stop it." And I remember the night before the game here, uh, it was Sean Fitzpatrick's um, uh, meeting. We're all sort of like an all in a uh, all in a semicircle. Laurie Maines has walked in, and just he just wants to see the colour of your eyes, see the colour of your eyes here. Looked around, and um, he said, you know, he just basically said, "Good luck." Walked out. Sean Fitzpatrick sort of uh, took over. He said, "Look, I just want to, you know, it's a big game for us, semi-final, playing England." Uh, there's only a couple little words, and uh, he went around to uh, to Jonah, and uh, said, "Jonah, you know, how do you sort of how do you feel? How do you feel at the moment? Is there anything you could, would like to say?" And Jonah just turned around and he just says, "Guys, I'm prepared to die in the black jersey tomorrow." And the whole room went like this, just like that, absolute silence. And he went, and that was it. And I went, bloody hell. And that just made my hair swell like this, and you sort of think, <coughs> you can bottle that, that, that adrenaline, that rush in that room there, you're right, right, you were just so pumped up for that game there. And I just said, and there was nothing else, nothing else. So we just sat there, we just sat there for about two or three minutes, and we just looked around the room here, just absolute silence. You couldn't hear a pin drop. Sean Fitzpatrick, ready to bring the All Blacks onto the field. The big question is, are New Zealand able to beat Will Carling's English side today? Carling brings out the England team for the 52nd time. The thing is, they want me to play the fast game because play the physical game with me, you ain't going to beat me. And, uh, and that's one thing I loved was the physical contact. And uh, nine times out of ten, I will dominate you physically. I knew that from the beginning, and the thing is, I always felt that you know, you know, they had to feel me physically first before they had to deal with the speed side. You know, and you're playing this mental game with them. Once again, Basham has it for the fourth time. Pass out to Lomu. Underwood can't take this. Is the big man. Tony Underwood steps in conveniently, ball goes over the top, bounces into Jonah's hand. Jonah then takes the outside, outside break. Will Carling coming across, and Will Carling then ankle taps him. So now, as a number 15, as a fullback, as we all know, we all love our rugby is, if a 15 has to make a tackle, that means 14 other people have missed that person to make the tackle. So, so therefore, he's run through 14 other blokes to get to me as a 15. But I remember him stumbling towards me, so as Carling's and then the next thing I remember is thinking, right, he's going at that angle at 18 stone, and I'm at that angle at 13 stone. I'm thinking, yeah, there's going to be a bit of a train smash here. Yeah? And um, so I thought to myself, right, what do my teachers teach me to go, go low, take his ankles out, drive through the tackle? And the next thing I remember is lying on my back and turning to the right. And um, Jonah was, was putting the ball down. The third time, going straight over the top of Michael Catt. Well, how, just how do you stop a man like that? I then got a, 
So I looked back up and there was Robin Brooke tapping me on the face saying, mate, there's a bit more of that to come. So uh, that was my initiation to, to Jonah Lomu, really. Well, when he scored that try, you, if you notice, I'm going like this. And it's not because I'm cheering, it's because I'm saying, never pass me the bloody ball. I keep telling them, they had a show called This Is Your Life not long ago. And I said to them, if Jonah had to pass that ball into me, it would be me doing This Is Your Life, Glen Osborne. The game carries on, Zinzan Brook, huge pass to, on the outside to Osborne. This is Lomu again. Lomu is through. Well, Rob Andrew was brushed aside by the big man. My first touch of the ball didn't look at anyone else, just my opposite number and run straight into him so you can feel how heavy I was, how strong I was. Then come back out, go at him again, come back, and then the third time, run straight at him and then just step to the left and go on the outside. And then, you know, and then they go, okay, what the hell am I gonna deal with now? Is he gonna come straight at me? Is he gonna run around me? So it's that mind game that you play. So you kept this going, and by the time you finish, the person's going, oh man, I don't want to be here. You try and play in the semi-final of the World Cup to, to, to qualify for the, the final, and you try and do that, and in 20 minutes, you see it all blown away. And that was when we started talking about this, uh, this athlete. I mean, if you, everybody saw the tries that he scored. That was the first time people, okay, now what, what do we do? Before uh, the 1995 Rugby World Cup final, everybody, that not everybody, but all the black people, 98% of the black people, whenever the All Blacks come to South Africa, they support uh, the All Blacks. And here, Jonah Lomer is a black guy, also playing for the All Blacks on the left wing, playing in a final against the Springboks. We're both uh, Polynesian, and we're both selected for the All Blacks at a, a similar age. Uh, I was selected at the age of 19 and in 1970. I was one of the first uh, players with dark blood to be allowed uh, into South Africa during the apartheid regime. We had a lot of support, particularly from the coloured uh, community, and so at airports and, and at hotels, uh, we were mobbed uh, like the current players, players are. So that was quite special, and, and Jonah, when he came along, I think... Um, very similar. It changed at a time when we when we got back in the final. Nelson Mandela asked the whole country to support the Springboks. They were obviously behind us as a Springbok team. But whenever Lomo will have the ball, they probably were supporting Lomo as a, as an individual for the All Blacks, but not the All Black team. The South African mindset is an interesting mindset. You know, everybody wanted to tackle Jonah Loma. Everybody wanted to be the first guy to smash him and try and bring him down. That's just the South African mindset. In the change room before the game, it was to calm the players down because the guys were incredibly excited. They, were, they wanted to go out and, you know, we had to make sure that the guys were very calm. The best memory for me was when Nelson Mandela walked into the change room just before the Rugby World Cup final. Um, when he came in this, uh, and surprised us as a team uh, and tell us, you know, to wish us luck and wish us all the best, give us all the best wishes for the game. Um, and uh, once he had left, um, no one spoke, everybody's quiet. Even the coach said, you got nothing to say anymore because if you're not motivated by now, your president walked into a change room with a rugby jersey and a rugby cap. You know, what else can motivate you at the time? And it was just amazing. Um, I can give you goosebumps as I sit there. Um, that uh, uh, he was a great inspiration for us, uh, but we still had to go out and stop John Aloma. The Nelson Mandela thing is, you know, is huge because, like, it doesn't matter how many times you meet the person, never changes. You know, the feeling that you know you're meeting a, a fantastic man, a great man. Mr. Mandela uh, will always be incredibly friendly. He he would ask normally, "How are you?" and "How are you feeling?" 
And because what Joan Aloma was on the front pages of every newspaper, it was natural. And when he turned around and he could see the number six on the back of his shirt, and you're going, oh, hell. And when you're talking about playing a mental game with somebody, man, South Africa did the perfect mental game, bringing someone out like that. And when the All Blacks did the haka, Joan Alomo was getting closer and closer to, to, to James Small. You know, he was really uh, excited. And what happened is Kubus Visa, our lock, he sort of broke away and he went to stand in front of Joan Alomo as if to say, you've got to run over me first before you get to, to James. And that epitomized the team spirit in the South African team. Good jump from Ian Jones, beautifully taken by the New Zealander. And Lolo straight through the middle, breaks one tackle. The pass. James Small did a fantastic job um, cutting Jonah off to come inside. You know, if, if Jonah got space, he's so quick, he's so strong, he's so angry, it's very difficult to stop him. But if you can get him into traffic, you know, that was always the, the, the idea. So what was going through my mind when Joel Stransky dropped the goal? There was still four minutes left. So what was going through my mind is catch the restart, make sure we get into their half, make sure we keep them calm, because a guy like John Alomo can score a try from inside his 22. So the whole thought process for me as a captain was, okay guys, we need to catch a restart. We need to consolidate, we need to get into their half, we need to start playing again. Because it's never over until the final whistle blows, then it's over. Back it comes to you, Sven de Vesthuizen. A little knock forward, but that's it. South Africa have won the World Cup. Having been back in international rugby for less than three years and having not taken part in the first team. It hurts losing that game. Uh, but to see how um, world rugby uh, brought a country together, um, a man like Nelson Mandela um, and also Francois Pina, you know, the combined of the Springboks and the nation uh, because of what the Springboks stood for before and what it stands for now. Uh, watching the vehicle of the Springboks now, growing that nation, uh, showing that pride um, has changed a whole lot of things and um, it's fantastic to see. And where rugby has grown from 95 to what it is now is, is fantastic. Of course we understood the politics in South Africa. Of course we understood um, what it would mean to do well for the country. We never in our wildest dreams, never ever, could have imagined the effect that rugby had on South Africa. You know when you first come out and in 95, you know, I was about 12 and, you know, you come into the into the rugby scene and played in the World Cup, South Africa. You know, there was this big brown Polynesian guy, you know, on the wing and that kind of, you know, inspired most of us, you know, kids. It, it certainly inspired myself. You know, here Jonah was, you know, throwing off the tacklers and, uh, you know, running a menace on the field, you know, and it, it brought a lot of joy to probably mostly Pacific Island kids and, and, and rugby players and, and mainly more or less Kiwis, I think. I think that, uh, yeah, all Polynesian boys are very, very humble at making it into the All Blacks and they're very shy, you know, shy race. 
and Jonah's no exception and, and saying, you know, he was just he was a very humble uh, person and just making it into the All Blacks, it's, it's a huge achievement for a, for a, a young boy, you know, from where he come from. And, and if I, I look back to the era that I played in, um, I think one of the iconic players that I looked up to was Brian Williams. The thing that characterises Jonah is that he's a very modest man. Um, he was always uh, very respectful um, and he, he, he never put himself on a pedestal. He, he was a worldwide star uh, when I coached him, but um, he was always uh, such a pleasant uh, guy, pleasant player to deal with. So um, he's, he's a very special person as well as a special rugby player. I think that's what I really appreciate of Jonah most is that he, you know, when you take away everything else, the superstar, uh, you know, the super athlete, uh, you know, the rich and famous part of who he is. What I love about Jonah is that he's, he's always had this really soft heart. One thing that doesn't change when you come into the changing room is your locker. You go in there, you know, um, it's always the same. Never greets you any different. Uh, but you know, you remember what, what order you need to hang up your clothes, and uh, especially when you you know uh, before a game. Uh, for me, it's always that uh, it's that order of me doing the things that I do in an area like this is you know, socks, shorts, shirt. And then before I run out and before I put on my all black juicy, I put my juicy over my head and I always turn around and I say, say my prayers before the game. And uh, you know, blessing the ground, the players, both teams, and may we, uh, you know, making sure that both teams don't, no, nobody gets injured in, in the game. Uh, it's not about winning, it's about just making sure that the guys are protected well out there on the field. And, uh, making sure that, you know, that we, we have a good, safe game. And, uh, and then I get up after I say, sit amen, put my shirt on, and then it's game on, it's time to go. I sort of floated along. I was baptised as a, as a Methodist, as a Christian boy. But the thing is, I never really felt I was, I was fitting. As some, a lot of kids do when you come from a very religious background, um, some follow that path, and some stray off that path, and some fall off that path. For me, I fell off it, well off it. Um, and then it wasn't until later on, and I started uh, thinking and thinking more about about religion. Finally, came down to the Mormon faith. But I think the greatest thing is that my mother said to us was, "I don't care what church you go to." It's just as long as you're still praying to God. And um, I found peace, harmony, and, um, and my kids. You know, and, and this is the way we, I believe me and my wife want to make sure that our kids grow up. I think he was a true professional, um, particularly given the popularity and the demands that were put on him by uh, what happened in 1995. Um, I think he handled all that very well. He never asked to be treated differently, and that's the mark of the man because I think he wanted, he always saw himself as a team man and part of a team. 
He did not want to be treated as anything special. We had to do certain things differently because we needed to manage him in the sense of publicity. I think his illness impacted significantly on his ability to be a 100% great player all of the time. Um, I had to nurse him three of the four years that I coached the All Blacks. I had to nurse him to get him to a fitness state where we could actually unleash him. The condition was uh, managed by Doc Mayhew, the All Black doctor, and he did a very good job of it. Um, he managed it through um, good medication, um, obviously within the boundaries of the drug laws that were in existence at the time. And of course, it affected Jonah in different ways. Sometimes he put on a lot of weight when he was on taking the steroids. Um, of course, that was all kept confidential and, and uh, was all legal. And sometimes Jonah would get the, a cold and it would really knock him because he didn't have the, the immune system that other people had. Man, in my prime when I was playing for the All Blacks, I was the most heavily tested rugby player on the planet by a mile. I was getting drug tested here pretty much every second day. And the thing is, it got to the stage where I, I pretty much knew the drug testers. I was going, yeah, okay. Yeah, I had nothing to hide. Um, they, they could do whatever test they wanted. Everyone that's great has knockers. Everyone that makes it to the top uh, will always have people who want to criticise. Unfortunately, the tall poppy syndrome is, is alive and well, and it's alive and well in this country. And so Jonah faced that sort of criticism because people had him on a um, pedestal and therefore some were trying to knock him over. To tell the truth, those people can write whatever they like. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that has to get up in the morning and train. They don't have to do that shit. The only thing that can hurt me and the only thing that bothers me is if not doing my job correctly out on the rugby field. the kids, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Daddy! <laughs> yeah, so now, a couple of your good mates there, Joey. Tell, yeah. tell us for a minute about, quickly about Joey and uh, Tana. Um, Daddy. most probably one of the best centers that ever played the Daddy. game, old Tana. Daddy. And uh, Joely. I guess my, my good friend Joely, he, um, uh, probably the most underestimated winger ever to play the game. Uh, unlucky. <laughs> with the illness to strike him, uh, same as me. Um, I was fortunate that I got a couple more years uh, on him in terms of playing, but uh, to this day, he's still the fastest man I've ever seen in boots. But more than that, it's just the friendships that I had with them. It's a lot like with you guys. Thank you for, uh, for coming and making this day a, a great day. I just want to make it more, uh, you know, days like this that we can all sort of get together. It doesn't matter where it is whether if it's on the beach or stuff like that. I just want to make sure that the friends and family don't forget each other. And uh, especially after all how long it's been. And uh, it's great to see you all. Um, I'm just a bit sad Dad's not here with us, but um, it just makes us want to cherish the days that we have with each other even more. It's been a while, but um, you know, it's a long time coming, but it's great to see everyone. Wow. A very kind man, soft, um, who changed dramatically when he got on the football field. When you're playing a contact sport like rugby, what happens on the rugby field stays on the field. You pretty much have to be a jackal and hide sort of thing 
the person that you're off the field is who who you are. Uh, the person who are on the rugby field is a completely different person. You, you become this uh, crazy local uh, person. It was a powerful um, surge of, of energy and, uh, and strength. But also at the same time, it's um, learning how to harness that, that energy. Because sometimes you can go over the top and then you forget about the game. So, you know, you, you make sure that you performed it the way it should be performed and the way that the Maori people would be proud of you doing it. World Cup, 99, versus England, Twickenham. I think that was, in my mind, the special moment I saw as a rugby player. This was a try where he got the ball 60 or 70 metres out. He beat people with swerve and pace. And then he had, I think, three or four Englishmen all over him as he got near the line. I think Lawrence Delagio was one and he managed to score at the end of what I thought was special. It takes two teams to, to make an amazing game. And uh, France has always been our bogey team. And they're always a difficult team to beat. But um, I guess the history between New Zealand and France is also amazing. I don't remember in my career having prepared a match in having quasi the certitude of losing. Because the enjeu du match was not to know who was going to win and who was going to lose. It was obvious, it was Blacks. They were, as you venir the grand favoris. The arm fatal was going to Enfin voilà, donc il y avait évidemment des, des joueurs exceptionnels. Et puis surtout, euh, j'ai encore la chair de poule quand je vous l'ai dit, c'est les blagues. Quoi, que quand on joue les blagues, c'est c'est les matchs que tout rugbyman cherche. Ça change un nombre de jouets quand les All Blacks. Je crois que quand tu joues les blagues, tu as peur. Euh, c'est une peur euh, saine, c'est une peur euh, déjà de prendre euh, beaucoup de points, euh, euh, d'être balayé. Euh, de ne pas rivaliser physiquement, donc tous ces paramètres-là, tu ne les maîtrises pas. Et, et euh, en plus, collectivement, ils se dégageaient beaucoup de force de cette équipe-là. Et puis, ils avaient un atout majeur qui était l'OMU, qui pouvait faire basculer un match à n'importe quel moment quand il décidait. Et donc, tous ces paramètres-là réunis font qu'on arrive, on a quand même la trouille grave. C'est peut-être pas les meilleures nuits que j'ai passées avant un match pour, pour préparer un match comme ça, mais malgré tout, euh, euh, mis à part ce côté un petit peu de, de crainte, de, de, de peur de, de, de rencontrer les Blacks et notamment euh, Jonah en face à face, je crois que j'étais déjà très heureux et très fier d'être de, en demi-finale de Coupe du Monde. Et puis surtout voir les journalistes, tout le monde parier sur ce match-là, etc. Où... Quand on a des caractères, quand on est sportif du haut niveau, on n'aime pas ça, on se sent humilié. Et en, par rebond, on va dire, à la fierté, et en se disant, je me souviens très bien, de, de nous dire, d'accord, on va perdre, mais on va laisser la peau sur le terrain. Quoi. Hors de question de nous faire humilier, hors de question d'en prendre 40, on va laisser notre peau sur le terrain, et si possible, on va amener quelques blagues avec nous. 
il y avait un phénomène qui était, qui était différent des autres. Je dis qui était, qui était une vraie plaie, qui était une hantise, mais qui était une hantise, pas, pas que de l'ailier, qui était une hantise du numéro 1 au numéro 15. Généralement, quand on joue un joueur, on se dit, bon, ben, les gars, ton duel en pilier, c'est costaud, voilà, tu ne focalises pas. Là, c'est un garçon qui focalisait toute l'équipe. C'est pas rien. Euh, jamais un ailier a focalisé un pilier au talon en disant, attends, c'est pas mon problème, là, moi, je m'occupais de, devant, j'ai assez à faire. Non, il focalisait tout parce que tout le monde avait compris, je dirais, l'urgence que, que si on n'était pas ensemble, on pouvait, on pouvait pas l'arrêter. Tout le monde en parlait de ça. C'était le premier plaquage. Et comme souvent, le match commence, vous voulez un petit peu faire quelque chose d'explosif de, pour rentrer d'abord dans le match. Le mois arrive, je fais quelque chose qui est interdit. Normalement, on n'a pas le droit d'aller à l'épaule. Je mets tout. Et forcément, alors, je ne sais pas si c'est un phénomène, j'ai même posé la question à un professeur de physique, il m'a dit, vous inquiétez pas, deux puissances qui réalisent comme ça, forcément, ils repartent du même côté. Vous, vous êtes parti sur 10 mètres. Lui, il fait demi-tour sur place. Heureusement qu'il heurte un Français, qu'il le remet sur ses appuis. Sinon, peut-être qu'il il serait tombé. Voilà, donc... Bon, bien sûr, il marque la tête. Moi, je suis dans, sur les poteaux, euh, un peu touché dans mon orgueil, parce que mon rugby, c'est un rugby physique. Benazi, qui, qui devait faire ses bons 115, 120 kilos, hein, qui arrive lancé comme un frelon et qui rebondit comme le même frelon sur un mur, j'avais dit, ça pique, si, si c'est moi qui dois lui sauter dessus, ça, ça va faire drôle. Fifi veut monter très vite en pointe, euh, essayer de donner un coup de pied dans le ballon, un truc comme ça, puis il le loupe, et là, là, il commence à se lancer. Et là, donc, tu vas... Euh, tu vas sans trop y aller, tu, 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 voilà, tu vois, tu... et puis on... tu, tu sens quand même une force, une énergie qui, qui se déplace, tu, tu sens une, une puissance, et, et le premier, c'est quasiment du suicide. Le rugby, c'est about fighting to win. Not physically fighting, fighting, but yeah, being physically demanding and dominating on the opposition within your rules. And the thing is, it's, uh, I found it natural because Uh, growing up in South Auckland, you had to have all these attributes to grow up in that arena uh, to be able to survive. I translated what I learned on the street to playing on the on the rugby field. On savait qu'il fallait pas qu'il ait le ballon. Il a eu deux fois. Il a marqué deux fois. Le moment où on savait ce qu'il était susceptible de faire et capable de faire, et puis il l'avait déjà fait. Donc, si tu veux, moralement, ça n'a pas trop affecté l'équipe. Évidemment, on s'est dit, mais merde, ces mecs sont en train d'emberger, ces mecs sont en train de douter. Toi, petit à petit, un drop de titou à droite, une pénalité, un essai, une action. La maison, When you play a team sport, you got to be a part of a team. And the thing is, you can't be a great player without the other players. And this is the thing you got to learn about rugby, is that it's a selfless game. Um, you have to sacrifice yourself at certain times to create something for someone else. Uh, and that's what makes a team. I've never felt um, that I was above any other player. The thing is, I've always felt that I was... I was always wanted to be the best player in my position, but I would never thought I was above anyone else in my team. For us to win, we needed the whole network in our team, the whole synergy to go to, to win this. Because we know France, they are our bogey team, they are sensational when they play. I don't know how they do it. Do they have 20 cups of teas or 20 coffees? I have no idea, they are a great team. Coup de siffle final est retenti, là j'ai vu cinq en black s'effondrer par terre. C'est l'image qui me reste. C'était d'un poids terrible. Comme quand on va à des enterrements, cette torpeur et cette lourdeur d'un deuil. Avec Domi, on est parti échanger nos, nos maillots dans les vestiaires des, des Blacks. Et il s'est levé, il m'a regardé comme ça. Et il m'a pris les deux mains comme ça et il m'a congratulé pendant, pendant 30 secondes en me tenant les deux mains, pratiquement les larmes aux yeux, bravo Philippe, super. Pour moi, définitivement, le 99 World Cup était le plus changement de 
that I, uh, memory that I could have. Uh, but the better team won on the day. For me, the game is uh, the game is like life. It's a short way of living your life fast. That's part and parcel of what rugby is. Um, you win some, you lose some. Some are more important than the others, but you know, um, as an All Black, um, you want to win every game. A standard transplant operation for a kidney transplant, we place the kidney very low in the abdomen, um, way down the bottom of the abdominal cavity, and that's for convenience. In Jonah's case, because he's told us that he uh, wants to potentially play rugby again, we thought that the safest place to put it was up near a native kidney, right up, up underneath the rib cage here, so that it'd be a lot more protected, just like a native kidney is. Yeah, it was one thing that I, you know, you, you had to accept as a, as a sportsman is that um, you're going to lose and you're going to win sometimes. And, uh, I was very fortunate that um, you know, I won more games than I lost. I've always talked about giving back to the game, and my initial reason why I left was to do that, almost to help grow the game. The reason why I went to Marseille was because I wanted to see that club grow. And um, my time in Marseille was great. The, the people of Marseille were fantastic. Um, yeah, it was, it was absolutely fantastic. If I look at it from a, from a different perspective, I did the same. And I understand why I did it. Meeting people, experiencing new cultures. And as a person, you grow. So I wasn't surprised when Jonah uh, went to play in France after his career. For me, it wasn't about leaving just because, you know, because of my name and this, that, and so forth. It's just I left the country because that was an opportunity to do something different. It's not purely for rugby reasons uh, that you go. You love the game, and if we can play rugby until we 100 years old, we'll keep on playing until we 100 years old. But the body only has a certain amount of time, and the level of rugby and the physicality of rugby has, has gone a lot higher so um, there comes a time then you have to say I you know I've got maybe a year two years left in my knees I want to go and experience something else and I think this is where some people will judge the different parts of his career whether his comeback was a success or a failure at the end of the day you can only judge it by what he set out to do and he set out to play rugby again and he set out to have an impact again as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's a success. The problem is that I don't think we ever saw the ultimate Jonah. Had we seen the ultimate Jonah, in other words, without illness, without injury to the extent that he was restricted, I think you would have been talking about Jonah in the Roger Federer, you know, um, Usain Bolt, um, name the great sportsman of this world. And I'm sure he would have been one of those names. He's not probably seen that way, particularly here in New Zealand, because probably people saw the weaknesses or the, you know, the problems that he had in playing the game at times, which now, of course, can be attributed to his illnesses. I think those in Europe would revere him probably more than he's revered in New Zealand. 
to me, that is a great personal disappointment because I, whenever I go overseas, uh, particularly in the times I was around the All Blacks or beyond it, his name was worldwide. I think New Zealand rugby did itself a disservice and the game a disservice by not championing him after he finished playing the game. I think he should have been someone we used as a great role model for the game, and it's tragic that that didn't happen. So, in my eyes, one of the top players that I ever saw. Was he the best? No, because I don't think we saw the best of him. Sevens, we'll be able to have more more countries enter and uh, and be able to compete. Uh, it becomes a, a level playing field for a lot of teams. The 15 man game is uh, is is always going to be there, but um, I think the new the new future of, of rugby is held in, in sevens. Vous savez, quand on a une ligne, une tribune devant l'ensemble de l'Assemblée Générale du CIO, vous avez 120 personnes dans la salle, tout le monde vous écoute, on délivre un message, mais tout le monde attend la présence de celui qui est derrière moi et qui, qui, qui attend le moment de pouvoir exprimer un, un message, qui est Jonah Lemou. Le fait de l'avoir avec moi, de, de conduire l'équipe et de, de pouvoir amener cette, cette, ce lien extraordinaire entre l'histoire de notre jeu et son actualité avec, avec la campagne olympique, c'est un, un, un apport extraordinaire. Yes, When you're writing in your journal and you're leaving things behind for your kids, uh, you know, what has dad done? Because I'm pretty sure when the boys get a little bit older, they'll get asked, um, what have you done, dad? I could turn to them and go, hey, you know, I helped rugby to get into the Olympic Games. There's not many people that can say that. He is arguably the most famous rugby player in the world and made his name at the World Cup. The most recent moment um, for me that that's that I've been extremely proud of Jonah and, and to see him was to be part of the opening ceremony of the Rugby World Cup. I think it was great for him, the beginning of it for those people that did see it with um, Ethan that had a number 11 shirt on and how he was fending off everybody. It was a fantastic tribute to Jonah and just the emotion that was inside of me that I felt and I had the two boys with me and we watched Jonah. It, it was just a fantastic experience that, you know, it, it's hard to explain how I really felt but that kind of summed up and it, and it showed obviously he had to be a special person to be able to be a part of that. Just over there. Are they your lot? Yeah. What class are they? Uh, good, good. Good. The young one? Oh. Is that, that one, one up the front over there? Yeah. All go, eh? Oh, yeah. Perfect. It's like fall over, hit his head, get up, still go. Uh, 
And that's your, that's your missus there? The yeah, yeah, in the blue. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I'll introduce you, bro. Oh, sweet. Josh. Nadine. Hi. Hello, Nadine. Lovely to meet you. You too. And this, that's Brayley. Hello, Brayley. Mr. Rao, come here. Yeah. They're pretty cool to jump Brayley. off, aren't they? Mr. Rao over there. Wow. Old troublemaker. <laughs> My whole life, um, you know, I was tested for, you know, uh, if I could have kids. And uh, the chances were 0 0.001. Joan had always told me and explained to me, you know, with his uh, medication and things like that, that the chances, the percentage was just very slim of, of being able to have children. So, um, it just took us by surprise. So I've been blessed with two kids, two boys, two fantastic, big, beautiful boys. <laughs> If I died tomorrow, I'd be an unhappy man in some ways, but also a happy man because I have two great sons and a lovely wife. And that is also why it's bittersweet for me if that happened. Uh, it would be bitter because you know I've left them so early, but in terms of leaving something behind for my kids and my wife, in terms of what they can remember me of, and what I've done, you know, I'll be handing it to them. I want them to grow up and have a life not as hard as I grew up, but leave for people um, and say that at the end of the game, um, life was the winner because um, your rugby career is only a short term but your life is longer than that. And uh, how you live it is still in the spirit of rugby. Thank you.